What is good? We're back. Oof, we got a fresh pour crack to start this one off, but we couldn't be more excited about our guest uh, today. You may recognize him from his days in a Latin jazz ensemble, uh, <laughs> but, but more recently, uh, his masterful work in the football space, more specifically his annual RSP, which is essentially an encyclopedia of information that is a must for any fantasy football DGEN. Um, we have much respect and, and admiration for this man, uh, Mr. Matt Waldman. Uh, welcome in, and uh, we thank you so much, man. Well, I appreciate you guys having me again. It, it was fun when we got to do it the last time. Looking forward to this time. And if anyone recognizes me from playing music, then you should be in the <laughs> FBI, the CIA, or any anti-terrorist organization because I don't look anything like I did back then. That's oh. hilarious. So, oh, Matt, man. you're actually going to read us the RSP today, right? Is this a, a reading <laughs> that, of the RSP that's, by that's Matt Waldman? You guys are strapped in. You got a lot of liquor back there. I think that, <laughs> you know, you'll look like me by the time I finish, you know, and I'll be dead. So there we go. Have you ever thought of putting the RSP down on Audible? <laughs> no. <laughs> Yo, with your voice. I've had requests. Yeah. Though. I could need an audio but, version to listen in the I, car on my way to I, work till football season. I've had season. requests, but I'm thinking if there's enough people and they're willing to really fund it so that I can retire after I do it <laughs> once, I'm good to do that. I'll give yeah. that a shot. Yo, you've got the voice for it. You would have to be the person that <laughs> read it. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I appreciate it. It would be it would be cool. I don't know, man. All I know is that the the joke is is that. I, I like to tell this as a smack talk thing, kind of more as a joke, because my wife and I laugh about it. Because she obviously liked my voice. It's probably I have a face for radio, but like she liked my <laughs> voice. So the joke is, I see a lot on Twitter. Guys are like, "Yeah, you're the only podcast for some reason that my that my wife is okay with us listening to in the bedroom." <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm kind of like I, I feel like I should make some smack talk about that and, yeah. and have a, and have fun with that. Play but a little. Yeah. Play a little sexy jazz sax see, in the back. There, see, there you go. So I don't even like, know about that talent. You know, uh -huh. all I know is that there's lots of cuddling after my show. So there we go. <laughs> that's that's. I, I feel good. I, I I guess there's some subliminal good thing about that. So sure. I'll take it. Sure. For sure. Well, you can, of course, if you're not already following him, you can follow him at Matt Waldman on Twitter. Uh, the RSP is available at mattwaldmanrsp.com. And if you haven't checked it out, I'm not really sure what you're doing. Um, it's just, like I said, it, it is a crazy amount of info, almost overwhelming. Like, it's definitely just, yeah, overwhelming. So much stuff that you want there. and things you didn't even know that you wanted or needed. It's just, you'll never, you, you'll never get all of it. You know, even if you read the whole thing, you're not going to get all of it. You got to yeah, read it the, twice. Yeah. It's an ever, it's kind of evergreen in a way as a result of that, because you can look at it two to three years from now, even in redraft leagues and say, oh, who's that guy that people are saying no one knew where he came from and you can get a scouting report on him and it's usually pretty good you know in terms of like what he can do or what he can't do um and yeah so i i've said pleasantly shocking readers since 2006 and i i you know i that's a sales pitch and a tagline but it's rooted in the truth because every every day i'm tweeting stuff to people who are like a first time buyer and i had no idea what i was getting yeah. here and i'm thrilled so i'm, I'm thrilled for that too all right. Well, you can also check out the podcast uh, on Matt Waldman. Uh, he's got all sorts of great stuff on there as well. So man in the YouTube channel, there's many ways to consume Matt Waldman and you should be uh, getting in on all of it. It's um, a crow, not a raven. Get it. Get it. Get that's it right. right. There you go. See, man, you guys are awesome from the jump. Yeah, this is I think he's we're going to really murder this one. You know, a little crow humor in there. Yeah, see, that? there we go. <laughs> Stupid. All right. Uh, we're going to kind of go through um, position by position. We'll start with the quarterbacks and, um, you know, fantasy wise, there's really, I think in general, there hasn't, there's so much tension or division seemingly in these quarterbacks right now. And that, you know, for fantasy, I'm, I want, I want Anthony Richardson for fantasy. Just, I mean, that's we, I want all that upside. I'll live with some of the downside. Um, but in opening the RSP, um, I noticed that you kind of shared some of the uh, similar sentiments that maybe not quite as raw as um, some people would like to point out. Can, can you expand on that a little bit? And are, are, would you, are you scared of Anthony Richardson? 
not at all. I'm not scared of him at all. And I'm, and he's my number one quarterback. And I think all three quarterbacks on this class that, that, you know, Richardson, CJ Stroud, um, and Bryce young, if someone said, I prefer one of those more based on where they wind up, I'm not going to argue with you. I'm, I like all three of them. I take any three of them, depending on where, where they fall to me. Um, but Richardson to me, I think has the chance to be the best of those players. And part of that is, is that it, we're not even going to talk about his athletic ability. You mm-hmm. know, everyone, that's what everybody talks about. To me, what separates him is that when you look at what really makes a good passer, it's not whether you remember everything on the whiteboard like a coach. It's not whether you have the big arm. Those are like baseline expectations. It's whether or not you can move efficiently in the pocket, whether you're, whether you're a Lamar Jackson type of runner who moves very efficiently in the pocket Kyler Murray's that type of runner, but he doesn't move efficiently. And he's still a pretty good quarterback for sure. Good mm-hmm. fantasy quarterback at times right. for sure. But it's being able to move efficiently and get uh, get the ball out quickly after you've moved that way. Can you manipulate defenders? Not the safety because high, good high school quarterbacks do that. And it's can you ma- manipulate multiple flat or interior defenders at the linebacker level or the safety level in the intermediate range can you can you manipulate them with your body positioning with looking it off with doing that while you're in the pocket moving under pressure can you then layer the ball over um coverage like justin herbert or patrick mahomes or matthew stafford in a pinpoint fashion after doing all those things not one of those things singularly because lots of quarterback prospects can do those one things. And you look at on ESPN and they go, look, Mitchell Trubisky, he just layered a throw. Ooh, Drew Locke. <laughs> he just, you, you know, he right. just manipulated this defender, you know, Ooh, Zach Wilson, he stepped up in the pocket. Well, and you know, but they didn't combine all those things. Cause that takes real talent to integrate those skills. Seeing cover two, that's just, having experience seen it enough if you've only started one year which he has you're going to see him and he's going to make mistakes he's going to come in and he's going to throw pick sixes against certain coverages that they're going to say oh well that's a basic coverage he should have seen that or he's going to try and make a hero throw like matt stafford when he was in detroit where you have a defender bearing down in his chest and he ends up throwing a hero ball that he right. should okay fine but the things i described earlier is hard to teach it's hard to integrate all that stuff. And I put it this way. Imagine if like the two of you guys, okay, one of you are, bo- are both going to like decide that you're going to learn a new language and you're going to Vietnam. You decide you're going to learn Vietnamese. And, you know, you're like, okay, one of you is like, okay, I'm getting a, I'm getting a guide. I'm, I've got a couple years of training or, or language training. I've got a conversation partner here in the States and I'm going over there and I've been there for two years. And the guide keeps you from going to like the worst parts of town. They keep you safe. They keep you in tourist oriented areas. They, they make sure you know which um, vendors aren't going to screw you over. No one's going <laughs> to sure. pull any cons on you. And, you know, you learn the language, you make some friends, but really if, after, after a year or two of being, after like two years of being there, the best things you can say are where's the bathroom and can you please speak a little slower for me um, and say that again. And then you still have, you're using your Google app. You're getting better, but you're, you know, you're like Mitchell Trubisky in that sense. <laughs> now the other sure. one of you, you didn't have the two years of training. You you had maybe a little bit of prep classes that you did on your own, um, and you didn't go to those quarter the equivalent the language equivalent of quarterback camps in high school. But you, you know when you got over to Vietnam and you've been there for only a year, the first couple of weeks you got taken, you got robbed, you got taken by a, a con man. Um, you know, you got lost a few times. It was frustrating at times. But the difference is that you had a knack for hearing the language at the native rate of speed and understanding it. You could hear the emotion that was being said. You could convey emotion back. You could speak at that rate. And so the second time someone tried or the third time someone tried to, to take you, you were able to use sense of humor to diffuse the relationship and actually make friends with the guy who's like, 
the kind of the con artist of, who's like taking advantage of tourists and they like you. And now they're going to show you around Vietnam and they're yeah. going to actually, you can trust them and they, and you become friends with them and their family. And they show you all the things that the other guy didn't see. Anthony Richardson's that guy. He's that guy that the, and he's an elite learner. Will Hewlett, who is his um, pre-draft quarterback coach who worked with Trevor Lawrence last year for a little bit before the season and worked with Brock Purdy the year before. I contribute scouting reports to Will Hewlett along with another guy that you may know, the QB school. Um, mm-hmm. And so we he's asked us to contribute reports. And I contributed mine before I heard back from Will. Like I contributed mine in December and Richardson was high on my board, was that high on my board. And uh, I asked Will back in March after I'd finished the – the quarterback section of the RSP was all done. I said, so what's it been like working with Anthony Richardson? And he said, the guy's an elite learner. Um, he is, he's special. And Will's worked with more people than Lawrence Purdy. And that. I mean, he also worked with CFL guys. He's worked with some, you know, pro guys who are, you know, just trying to make the league. He's also worked with high school players. And one of the high school players he works with was Drew Bledsoe's son. Mm-hmm. Now, if Drew Bledsoe trusts you, you know, Drew Bledsoe, sure. Trust you, trust you to to work with your son. You know a little bit about quarterbacking. So, you know, when he said he's an elite, elite learner, unlike anything I've seen, he's different. And then when I've seen another guy on Twitter who said, when I first saw Anthony Richardson installing an offense, I didn't know he wasn't a coach. I thought he was a coach. Um, yeah. So Richardson may not have seen the culture of coverages that you would see, that you're going to see in the NFL – or at high level college football and be always familiar with them. But when he knows what he's doing, he does it with the intricacy and nuance of a veteran. And that's something you can't teach. And when I look at that, um, that those grades and his decision-making were much higher than people realize. And that's a different kind of raw, you know, it's like you, you may know how to, if you know how to use tools, and you can do them, you know, you're someone who does this kind of work. If you know how to use a hammer and all the sorts of ways that a guy who's been doing it 40 years or a drill or, you know, different things on how to put things together carpentry-wise, you may have never done a certain project before, but it's likely that you're going to be able to conceptualize in a way that you might screw it up once, but then you're going to build it three times better than anybody else did. Right. And that's kind of where Anthony Richardson is. Yeah, so you know, <clears throat> I love hearing the, that elite learner and like. Sorry to cut you off, Casey. Okay. Just, I just wanted to jump in real quick because it's like when you can find out those tidbits about players, it's not always readily available. You can watch interviews. You can, and we're obviously not talking to coaches and whatnot, and and, and assistant coaches and all this scouts, and we're not in that realm, you know. But you can get wind of of players and and what's going on off the field. And to me, that's just like. Man, I've been on. I've been on. I've been taking Anthony Richardson as the first QB off the board. You hear he's elite learner, and I'm like, I'm. That's all I needed to hear. Like, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so it's translating it, it's not just knowing the coaching board because you know they say every year, you you know it's the the books the 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 book smarts the the rote memory. That's like SAT smarts. That's right. fine. We all know lots of people who scored high on the SAT. And then we know people who didn't, who actually are like for real life smart. And Anthony Richardson is for real life smart. And that's yeah. processing smarts. That's that teams are starting to come around on and figuring, trying to figure out ways to test that. Right. That makes makes a lot of sense. So how much in your process? I've, I've been doing this for much less time than you have and at a nowhere near uh, advanced of a level. But. You know, the further and further I get into it, the more and more, you know, some guys can certainly get by of being the elite of the elite and not having the best work ethic and, and whatever. But for, for the most part, it seems to me the guys who flame out and never become anything are the guys that you catch wind of later that just didn't love it, didn't 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 have that burning desire, didn't have uh, the work ethic, didn't want to be great. And how if you can find that kind of information out, how much does that play into, you know, your scouting? And I have a theory of how you can find that information out on the field, okay? And it, and Drew Locke was a good example of that. Um, Drew Locke 
when I and this can and I got a story afterwards that confirms it. And this will be the good lesson for it is that my theory has always been that when a player is facing competition that they're playing down to, and if he can get get away with things that aren't technically sound for what you're looking for in terms of footwork, releases, um, how you read plays, how you read defenses, chances that you take that maybe you shouldn't, that won't qualify won't work in the NFL, but they work just fine in in against a lower level college team. Um, then if they're playing that well, that's for one thing. But if they start trying to do the technically sound things against the better teams um, and they're not able to do it, then that tells you they're not working at it. They're mm-hmm. not working at their craft enough. Doesn't mean they won't get better at it, right? but they're, they haven't worked at it. And Drew Locke was that player. Drew Locke was the guy who – and what happens is a lot of these young guys get enabled because they're you're the best – high school quarterback in the nation or one of the 10 best. So sure. you're going to get better at this stuff. And then you go to an SEC college. It's mid-level, mid-level SEC team at that time. And everybody's like, you're good enough to start. And if you don't screw the, you know, even the things that you need to get better at that we review with you, you know, that's on your own to work on, but they're, they're not benching you for it. But then when you right. face, you know, so when he faced, you know, the central Arkansas and he's getting great stats and he looks great, but the, all the things, the techniques aren't there. But then he plays Alabama, Florida, Georgia, and he looks like someone who didn't work on his his high, his his project every day. And he looks like someone who who's just unprepared. And he's trying to do the right things, and he just it falls apart. That translates to the NFL because you haven't ingrained the skills enough to do that. So later on, my buddy Cecil Lammy, who works at Football Guys with me, um, he covers the Broncos. He knew that when I wrote up my scouting report, I said he's like the kid who isn't doing his homework and has been kind of enabled. He's very talented, but he's going to find out too late that the game's passed him by. Well, Peyton Manning apparently called him first year and said, hey, anything you need, let me know. And his first response wasn't, I need you to help coach me on playing the position. Break down my game. Help me get to the point I need to be. Don't spare me anything. You know, instead, he said, thanks, didn't call him back. And for two (laughs) years, you know, he's still the hopeful guy. They bring in Teddy Bridgewater. And at Teddy Bridgewater, once Teddy Bridgewater, he was like, oh, the writing's on the wall. I'm going to have to compete for this job, and I might not win it. I need to call Peyton. Okay, well, Dad tells Cecil, you know, d- you know, look, I love Drew. He's my son. He's a great kid. He really is a great guy. But for years since high school, I've been telling him, if you want to be a good pro, you've got to work at these things that people are telling you. You've got to do these little things mm-hmm. because once you get to the league, you've got to have these things down. It's going to be a big difference. And he never did it. Interesting. That's, the, that's yeah. the difference. If you look for those techniques and they're not there, look at like, that's why CJ Stroud, when you look at his footwork, it's strong. His play fakes are strong. He does a lot of things right. So he's safe because once everything gets too fast in the NFL, more complex, um, and he's got a more complex playbook, more complex defenses, and more complex disguises to look at it's less likely that certain fundamental things are going to fall apart in his game because his head's swimming. Some of them will, but not as many as Richardson and Young from the jump. Those guys, I think, will get better at it, and they'll overcome it. But Stroud is is safer because of that, because fundamentals are more ingrained. Gotcha. So, But you feel pretty good about the top three quarterbacks in general, not not, um, no, no real issues with any of them. Bryce's size doesn't bother you. No, if, if Kyler Murray can play in the NFL, I feel pretty good about Bryce Young because Bryce Young's a better mover in the pocket um, because he's more efficient. Um, and so I Probably like that. been working at things a little differently than Kyler Murray has, if if you want to you know, be honest about For sure. how, you, how those two guys appear to body language-wise and, and act. Um, yeah. You know. Yeah. So I no, I mean, unless he winds up in a system that asks him to do a lot of dropbacks, like like real like technically difficult types of dropbacks, and with a wide variation, he's gonna have to work at that. 
but most teams are going to put him in a spread in a pistol and, and let him do that. And I don't think that he's going to have, uh, well, it'll he's going to be, probably be Carolina or, or Houston. Cause uh, you know, and you feel, you feel fine about, there isn't a landing spot that would make you feel uncomfortable about those guys. Really. I mean, you just said a difficult yeah. drop back, but you know, there's not too much that would make you vary up those quarterbacks and be worried about one or the other. Um, if the, if, uh, if Bryce Young or, or Anthony Richardson went to the Las Vegas Raiders with Josh McDaniels, I would not like that because Josh McDaniels is a is a very harsh type of personality with mm-hmm. his players. Um, I've told the story in the past, but he reamed out Jay Cutler on the first day of their meeting on the phone. Not, hi, how are you? Looking forward to working with you. No, basically, you suck. This is how bad your game is. This is how <laughs> terrible you are after his Pro Bowl season. Uh-huh. And Jay Cutler turned to his agent with the GM in the room. And the GM told me this story. Um, Ted Sunquist used mm-hmm. to have a show. And Brandon Thorne, the great offensive line analyst, um, he he was the production assistant, and I was the, the guest. And Ted told this story on air, told the story about how they the Broncos knew that Jay Cutler was good and was going to be good. But after the Pro Bowl season, they didn't think he was still ready, fully there yet. They knew he had work to do. But when Shanahan was gone and they brought in McDaniels, McDaniels was so harsh. It was like there's a story about Vince Lombardi and, and, and like a biography about him, about when he first was he was a young coach with the New York Giants, that he was so harsh with veterans and a know it all and just not a fun person to deal with that the veterans came in one day on the road and into his hotel room and said, look, man, like <laughs> you, you, you're, you're smart. We know you are. You don't have to prove it. Can you right. just, you got to chill out. You're Knock this to shit off, out. man. Nobody yeah, likes this exactly. shit. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's We're all exactly grown men here, man. Right. Yes. And Fuck, he figured your tone's that all wrong. You're talking to my guy all wrong. That's okay. right. And you know, he turned into a great coach and he certainly was still a yeller and, and tough, but he learned McDaniels, right. McDaniels did the still drive the quarterbacks out of town, huh? He still is. And it's like, and so that would be a tough system for a lot of, for everybody, but Stroud probably. And I don't even know if Stroud, if the rumors about Stroud are true, and I don't know if they really are. Um, th- there's some, there was one rumor about that. He may not be the easiest guy to work with, but I don't mm. think that's true. I think he'd probably be good in that system because listen, the only guy who survived Josh McDaniels, probably I'm not saying he's had a lot of this, but the guy that, he worked with the longest is Tom Brady. Tom Brady's not going to put up with any shit from anybody. No. You know, no. and he's the guy, He and you see him. He was yelling at Josh McDaniels through his sure. entire career. Like, and, and oftentimes it was shut the fuck up and <laughs> go away. And, yeah. you know, I've got this. You don't know what you're talking about. But they had that good relationship where they probably could do that with which, each other. Which probably almost enabled uh, McDaniels a little bit to, he got comfortable in that style because he had somebody with the, you know, the, the resume and the personality to kind of, and never really had to evolve. That's right. That's right. right. So so it's not necessarily attack on McDaniels. His history, that was a bad moment with Cutler. But and and then they had to trade him to the Bears and and Sunquist said that the Bears thought that he was a finished product. They knew that he wasn't. And when the Bears treated him like a finished product, his career just went down the down the shoots and he just turned into the meme that people say he was. But it's too bad because he was really a promising prospect. All right, I'm going to le- get out of the quarterbacks with two more questions. We're, let's give me a little thought on Will Levis, and then after you, after that, hit me with uh, some some sleeper quarterbacks if you were fantasy drafting uh, sure. outside of those guys. Will Levis to me is um, I understand that if he finds the right system, that he has the arm, the size, and some um, experience with drops to become an NFL caliber quarterback. I'm not saying a starter, an NFL caliber quarterback with some work. Um, Right now, to me, he's basically being um, overvalued due to his arm and due to his size and some athletic ability. He's the toolsy guy that that people are um, saying Anthony Richardson is. that um, Because when you look at his game, processing – Information is the most important thing with quarterbacks um, beyond the baseline levels of athletic and arm talent. Okay. So you, you when you see the leverage that's advantageous, the ball got to come out just like a good comedian tells a joke with good timing. Sure. And you can have the greatest joke and have shitty timing and the joke sucks. Doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Will Levis is not very funny. Let's put it that way. 
Um, he, he's not, <laughs> he's not very funny and he can have great jokes and he ruins them. And part of that's due to, because he's a beat to three beats slow with reading the field. He doesn't have great pocket presence. He doesn't integrate his skills well. And on top of that, he's got a technical flaws with his footwork where he's not, you know, the back, the midline of the back foot has to be aligned to the, where the target's going to be, not where the target is. That's one of his problems. The other one is that the front foot, where you're going to have the really refined accuracy generated along with that back foot, that front toe needs to be pointed to where the target's going to be. He's got it pointed off in space, far off to the boundary oftentimes. And then he's trying to like have his feet go in opposite directions to meet where they're supposed to be as the ball's coming out. And so when that happens, his accuracy is often really um, inconsistent at best. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at that and then you consider that he has a, a quarterback coach who came from the NFL and and that either hasn't been addressed or Will Levis hasn't worked on it after it's been addressed, um, after having a year of that quarterback coach, tells me that he's not working at his craft to the, with the right things. And maybe he'll figure that out and get there, but it's not there yet. His grade is, I don't, he's going to be, It's going, my grade's going to be wrong because he's going to get a shot in the NFL early. He's going to have high draft capital. And that means he's going to start probably and have some successful moments or even some weeks before NFL defenses get the scout on him, like Zach Wilson and Baker Mayfield and um, Mitchell Trubisky and Drew Locke and all the guys that I had lower than the consensus before him who looked, had glimmers of hope. And then defenses said, we know what you're about and we're going to test you to see if you can overcome it. And they couldn't to be starters, but Will Levis, my grade for him is that he's not, he's not an NFL caliber quarterback, even as a backup, he's a developmental project. Yeah. He was a spoiler an RSP overrated player on, on under the quarterbacks. I was I had to I saw that and I was like reading it and some of the things you said you were talking about you know Drew Locke and in the game where you know he can get away with this against lesser talent but then when he's trying to get the mechanics correct against better talent he still can't do it. It shows you he's not working at it. Will Levis they were saying some of that stuff about him and the footwork and the mechanics being all wrong at the combine like throwing against air. And I'm like, man, that's a major red flag for me. They're criticizing this man's footwork and, and technique at the combine, you know? Like, yeah. come on. Yeah. So it's all scripted. It's against air. You like haven't you been said. doing this like every day. You know, Anthony Richardson looked like he had prepared for that combine. You know what I mean? He was like, well, he yeah. that combine is yeah. bitch. And not just from the athletic standpoint, like he was out there. And to, notice we didn't even talk about Anthony Richardson's ungodly athletic ability. Sure, I mean in that's this a, that's podcast, a, right? Yeah, right. I mean, but which is what makes the him my number one fantasy quarterback that that you would want. Um, but hit me with a little bit of sleepers before we go to the running backs here. Well, who, well, who because, do you like if you were, you know, out of the first round, wherever you see fit for a quarterback or two, super flex rookie draft. Sh- sure. So. You know, these are for deeper leagues because, you know, people are going to talk about Hendon Hooker, and I think he can eventually become right. a, a you know, journeyman starter at best, probably a backup, um, but he's not on my list right now. You know, he's okay. You can you can probably get him later. But if I'm going to go for somebody later that I think can be a good journeyman starter and maybe break that plane to become a starter, it's going to be Jake Hayner out of Fresno State. Doesn't have a great arm, but he's got a little better arm than Brock Purdy. He sees the field a little better than Brock Purdy did, or at least was a little more, um, a little um, savvier about when to make certain decisions. He moves well in the pocket. He's tough as nails. Um, he's someone that has a good play fake game. He can be versatile enough to play in a number of different offenses, and his arm is just good enough to be an NFL contributor, if not a starter. Um, Stetson Bennett. People are down on him because. For a variety of reasons, they see him as like a Colt. He's too McC- old. He's, he's too old. He's weak armed. All this thing. He's not weak armed. He's got a strong arm, and he moves like a slot receiver. He's got the the athletic ability of a slot receiver. He's putting he's guys on athlete. skates People out are, there. Yes, yes, he has. So they think, oh, big Georgia team, big Alabama team, big Miami University of Miami team, Texas, Oklahoma, whatever team that had the had the the seemingly undersized white quarterback who. <laughs> who like was good in college, but like they, they, they associate that with him. 
where he actually threw the lights out of the ball at the combine. Um, he's a pretty good decision maker, can get a little bit better, but he's a playmaker. He's a better playmaker than people realize. And, um, you know, I think he could become that guy that in that Jake Hanger mold. And the last one I'll say is Tyson Bajan, who has the arm to be a starter. He worked at Shepherd, which is a college in West Virginia. The biggest question is he worked at Shepherd College in <laughs> sure. West Virginia. So can it translate? He played it. He was invited to the Senior Bowl. So they think he can because Senior Bowl guys usually get grades of fourth round and above mm-hmm. by scouts. Um, so he may not go that early, but he can move. He can throw. He has good layering of throws. I like his ability in the pocket. He's someone I'd keep an eye on if he can get the speed of the game and acclimate there. He could be better than the other two guys I just mentioned. Yeah, we're digging up Shepherd tape now. There, there is, uh, there's commitment right there. Yeah, that was definitely YouTube tape. I'll say that. <laughs> gotcha. 